You can start now or you can wait, it's up to you. Okay, uh, we can start now so give Dr. Ho some more time. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us on the, another uh, webinar series. And let me see, some housekeeping, um, just please mute your microphone. Um, so then that way we can hear Dr. Ho. Um, and then try to keep this interactive as much as possible. So we will really appreciate everyone can share on their video screen if, 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 if able. Um, and if you want to ask a question, please feel free just to post a question on the chat bar um, or just send them directly to me and I can ask Dr. Ho towards the end. Um, how to change usernames is um, unless, uh, for those who don't know, type in the rename on the participant and that way you can see, enter your full name and you can put the parentheses, the institution you're from as well to keep it more interactive. Um, for CME accreditation, um, you can definitely claim um, um, if, if, you know, based on the conference email address, uh, if you are not sure, uh, you can always email the NS, uh, NCSCG at paceadmed.com. Uh, uh, online evaluation form, we would love to um, uh, receive your feedback. Um, you can enter it through um, that website or the QR code. And for the fellows that are attending, uh, we definitely would like to uh, kind of replicate that uh, in-person experience. So then if you had uh, any orders of food, uh, feel, free, feel free to uh, submit your reimbursement to Danny. Uh, we would love to uh, also acknowledge the following educational grants um, to support this educational activity. Um, here are come some of the upcoming uh, seminars uh, for for you just to uh, kind of save the date. Uh, we'll make sure you'll send them out uh, a month in advance. And also, like thank you our educational committee, um, including the committee chairs, as well as a fellow. And then lastly, for Danny um, for organizing everything as always. And you can follow us on Twitter uh, or subscribe just on YouTube or follow us on Facebook. So. Um, I would love to introduce you, um, you know, to our speaker for the evening. So Dr. Chanda Ho is a transplant hepatologist at uh, California Pacific Medical Center at San Francisco. Uh, she received her medical degree from the University of Tennessee um, and completed her residency at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, followed by fellowships in gastroenterology as well as transplant advanced hepatology at UCSF uh, prior to joining faculty at CPMC. Uh, she's currently the Chief Innovation Officer uh, for Transplant and directs the Clinical Operation for Hepatology. Some of her clinical interests include telemedicine, informatics, as it relates to the care of her patients with chronic liver disease. Her clinical interests are in hepatitis B, cirrhosis management, as well as clinical informatics, which she is also board certified. Uh, Research-wise, she is a site lead for CPMC in a multi-center collaborative with ASOD Cirrhosis Quality Collaborative. collaborative. And it's also the site PI for R01 uh, study with UCSF investigating uh, liver cancer epidemiology. Uh, she's a recipient of numerous uh, research awards as well as authors of several research articles and is active in medical education. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ho, for taking the time to teach us about this very interesting topic. Great, thank you guys uh, for the kind introduction. I like my <laughs> pre-pandemic picture <laughs> that I have there. Um, can, you, can, can everyone hear me okay? I, I think so. Um, so what was I going to say? Um, and thank you, Dr. Wong, for the, for the invite. So the topic that we're going to discuss today is um, vascular liver diseases. So um, as you can tell and know that this is a potpourri topic, um, it encompasses a lot of different aspects. Um, so what I will do is um, I will start off with discussion, discussing a little bit about coagulation and hemostasis and cirrhosis um, and what's out there in terms of literature with regard to risk stratification, with regard to bleeding, portal vein thrombosis, and that's separated into how to manage PVT in both cirrhotic and non-cirrhotic patient populations. And then delve a little bit into some of the rarer vascular liver diseases such as SOS, HHT, non cirrhotic portal hypertension, as well as briefly touching on, you know, how do we best manage hepatic and splenic artery aneurysm. I will not be covering pediatric issues in this talk. Um, the sources for my talk come from two guided statements, which were actually published this, uh, this past year. So one is the ASLD 2020 Guidance Statement on Vascular Liver Disorders, PVT, and Procedural Bleeding, and the other one is the ACG Clinical Guidelines. So um, if you guys have any questions in terms of sources, those are the two main documents that I used uh, to prepare for today's talk. 
Um, next slide, please. So this is the portal venous circulation. Um, when we talk about vascular liver disorders, we are talking about this. So um, this is a nice um, pictorial from um, ACG clinical guidelines. So as you see here, you've got the portal vein, 75% of the blood flow goes through the main portal vein, 25% going through the hepatic artery. The portal vein is formed by, and I guess you can, I, won't, I don't have a mouse, but the portal vein is formed by the confluence of the splenic vein and the SMV. Um, the IMV drains in to the splenic vein, and then the portal blood drains into the sinusoids, into the IVC, and then through the hepatic vein. So that's kind of the general area of what we're talking about when we're talking about vascular liver diseases. Um, next slide. Um, so coagulation and hemostasis and cirrhosis. So, you know, there's been a lot of research done in this realm, and, you know, we're not going to, I'm not going to focus on kind of coagulation pathways and the pathophysiology. Um, but what we do know is that in cirrhotics, um, we have a simultaneous Hyper, hyper coagulable and a hypo coagulable state going on at the same time. And so, you know, contrary to kind of what some of us were taught in med school, um, sorry, I'm just, I have an echo because I have two devices. So I'm going to, no, actually, I'll, I'll be okay. Um, you know, contrary to what we were taught in medical school, it's not just one or the other. And so, what we know now, even in a, in a cirrhotic, you can have both bleeding and clotting going on at the same time. And so the bottom line is that hemostatic pathways and cirrhosis are kind of in a precarious balance. And, you know, we've got some laboratory parameters, right? We've got platelet count, we've got INR, um, and, but they're, they're not adequate, but that's kind of all we have. Um, there are kind of more global tests of hemostasis. You know, some of our anesthesiologists rely on these, but they haven't really been clinically validated. So. Um, it's not something that people are using kind of in prime time in everyday clinical practice. Things like thromboelastography and road temp testing. Like I said, you know, I think a lot of the anesthesiologists use it um, during a transplant, but um, really we're just relying on our usual tests that we check on our inpatients every day, CBCs, INRs, and things like that. Um, next slide. So, okay, I've got, you know, a lot of us are taking care of sick cirrhotic patients. So you're telling me, all right, there's hyper and hypocoagulable state. So what do I do about that? And especially, what do I do about my cirrhotic patients getting a procedure? Um, you know, the ASLD, you know, they're, you know, pioneering kind of this kind of mind shift, right? Because those of us who are in clinical care every day, what are we doing? We're focusing on platelet count and INR, and a lot of us are still in the process of correcting for coagulopathy prior to procedures because we've been taught that that's what we need to do to decrease bleeding risk in our patients. Um, and depending on when we went to medical school, we have this teaching that um, patients with cirrhosis are auto-anticoagulated, auto so they don't need to be anticoagulated if they have a thrombotic disorder. Um, but how I want to frame this is kind of guided by the guidance in both ASLD and ACG, and it's thinking about, you know, low versus high-risk procedures and what constitutes a low versus a high-risk procedure. And also thinking about bleeding, not just like, oh, they're bleeding and they're cirrhotic. It's kind of separated into kind of three different categories. One is you could have actual hemostatic failure. You could have just, you know, low platelets and low fibrinogen and, you know, DIC and that type of picture. Um, you could have procedure-related bleeding just because you have portal hypertension, um, and that's just a kind of mechanical pressure issue. Or it could be due to vessel rupture and puncture through a, me through a mechanical injury. Um, so those are the things to think about when you're trying to risk stratify your patients in terms of, you know, what is their bleeding risk and what are other, you know, what are other things to consider. Um, next slide, please. So I had this Venn diagram up on the previous slide about um, different factors. So not only is there the procedure-related bleeding factors, there's also the technical, um, there's the actual liver disease that the patient has, and there's also other systemic factors. So what do I mean by that? Um, liver disease, so do they have advanced portal hypertension? Someone who has child C cirrhosis is going to have more advanced portal hypertension than someone who's child A. And then as we are learning, you know, there's also acute on chronic liver failure, and those patients certainly behave differently and they're, they're sicker than your run-of-the-mill decompensated cirrhotic patients. 
Um, so it matters kind of where your patient is on the spectrum of liver disease. Um, and it's not just their liver that matters. You know, your patients with CKD um, are going to be at higher risk for bleeding. Depending on what medications they're on, they're going to be at higher risk for bleeding. So you're beginning to see there's this complicated picture with each patient about all the different factors that play into, the, that play into their bleeding risk. Um, next slide. So this is from ASLD. They've kind of grouped procedures into low risk versus high risk. And these all largely make sense. Um, the ones that, you know, we're ordering frequently in our patients that are in the low risk category are the para and the thoris and TCs, um, PIC lines, just, you know, venography, angiogram, CAS without intervention, um, EGD colon enteroscopies, and even routine band ligation is under um, low risk category and ERCP without a sphincterotomy an EUS without an FNA, a bronch without a biopsy, a dental procedure, as long as there's no extraction, those are all kind of low risk. Um, what is high risk? If you actually have a biliary intervention, ERCP with a sphincterotomy or putting a stent, um, any sort of organ biopsy, including liver biopsy, um, you know, our HCC treatments that we might order, ablation, taste tape, um, polypectomies, EMRs, dilations, so that all makes sense, um, the FNA, um, a TIPS procedure, a dental extraction. So those are the two kind of main categories. So we have guidance from different societies based on, you know, low versus high risk procedure. Um, next slide, please. So contrary to kind of what we might have been taught, there are no specific evidence-based cutoffs for INR and platelet count, which will magically decrease a patient's risk of bleeding. So I think it depends on, you know, what institution you're at, um, who your colleagues are, you know, that kind of dictates um, kind of how much you correct a certain patient or kind of, you know, what you're historically used to. Um, routine transfusions, so the ASLD says in their newest guidance that routine transfusions prior to paracentesis and endoscopy are not indicated. Um, furthermore, the ACG does not recommend FFP to improve thrombin generation in cirrhotic patients. So that's really interesting, right, because I'm on the inpatient service right now and all we're doing is, is we're giving FFP to potentially decrease patients' risk of bleeding and, you know, here, we, here I am discussing guidelines that tell me otherwise. Um, the ACG does not recommend prophylactic platelet transfusion, sorry, that's supposed to say for, for routine banding or paracentesis, um, unless you have a renal function that's with a creatinine greater than 2.3 or you have a sepsis. Um, so, you know, th that's, I'd like to take a pause there because that's, again, um, just so different than I think what we do day to day in a clinical practice. Um, previous studies have shown that the most important factor associated, for example, with the post uh, banding ulcer bleeding was having advanced cirrhosis. Um, and a lot of ulcers tend to occur after the procedure. And so there's this argument that if you correct them during the procedure, um, it's actually not really gonna alter the, the patient's bleeding risk, that they're gonna bleed afterwards anyway. Um, and really, you know, kind of all this correction is really to make the procedural list feel better. Um, next slide. Okay, so platelets. Um, all right, so data suggests that platelet transfusions do not improve thrombin generation capacity or viscoelastic markers of bleeding risk. And then furthermore, as we transfuse these products into patients, that does carry a risk of trolley, um, transfusion-related acute lung injury. Um, so again, platelet transfusion is kind of routinely not indicated. Um, we know that there are agents um, that are FDA approved that kind of increase your platelet count and what are those? I just listed them. It's l trombopag Abitrombopag, and Lusutro, I can't even pronounce it, Lusutrombopag. Um, for l trombopag um, there was a RCT that was cited in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012 that actually showed that it led to ex excess thrombotic events amongst derived patients and that study was actually terminated early. Um, the other two agents, they do have FDA approval um, for thrombocytopenia, so it's actually indicated for low platelet counts in patients with chronic liver disease, and you can. Uh, their whole indication is that, you know, if you have a patient who's going to have a procedure, 
um, you could give this instead of like slamming them with platelet infusions, you know, prior to the procedure. So if the procedure is already scheduled in advance, then you can time it to boost their platelet count. Um, but again, there, you know, a lot of these studies were limited mostly by retrospective data, um, not a lot of huge numbers. Um, but um, the studies that are that are cited in these guidances actually say that even though that these meds have FDA indication for increasing your platelet count it may not actually um, alter your bleeding risk. So no difference in post-procedure bleeding risk between treatment and placebo. So that's a little bit discouraging. Um, <laughs> DDABP, what about that? Um, again, um, a couple studies um, cited uh, DDABP, which we also give, especially in patients who might have renal insufficiency, um, hasn't really been shown to decrease risk of bleeding in cirrhotic patients. Um, and one of them was an RCT looking at cirrhotic patients undergoing dental extraction. There was not a difference seen between those who got DDAVP and those who um, did not. Okay, um, next slide. So here is a table. This one's from the ASLD guidance. And as you can see, depending on which um, society you're in, they have different kind of recommendation cutoffs for platelet count. INR and fibrin engine. Um, so ASLDs, like they're they're bold. They're like no routine pre-procedure correction for platelet count. And this is for, um, if you look at the title, it's for um, before invasive procedures with a high risk of bleeding. So um, procedures on that right side of that list that I had um, on my earlier slide. So for platelet count and INR and fibrin engine, ASLD is saying you don't have to correct to any goal. Um, then the AGA and ACG are similar. They say greater than 50 for platelets, you don't correct for INR. And then fibrinogen, you should boost it up to greater than 120. And uh, the Interventional Radiology Society says platelet count greater than 30, INR less than 2.5, and a fibrinogen greater than 100. So um, the ACG in their guidance adds, because the, the table four here is from ASLD, ACG had written, um, you know, higher platelet counts may be indicated for high-risk procedures, which makes sense with this platelet count cutoff of 50. And they also added in the comment of you can also consider the TPO agonist, which ASLD said, you know, actually not really helpful. So just kind of giving you what, what these guidances say. Um, next slide. So INR, I love INR. It's a surrogate of synthetic function. It lets me know how well my patient's livers are doing. Um, and because it is a surrogate of synthetic function, it can correlate with bleeding risk, um, more so secondary to their severity of liver disease rather than your bleeding risk related to hemostatic failure. So going back again to what are all the different factors that play into a cirrhotic patient's bleeding risk. Um, and Again, INR alone is not a reliable indicator of hemostatic balance and does not accurately predict bleeding risk due to hemostatic failure. And it doesn't correlate with thrombin generation. Um, and as we had shown in the previous slide, you know, ASLD doesn't recommend correction for INR. And in fact, light platelet transfusions, you know, FFP, can also lead to trolley. And, you know, all this extra volume can lead to increasing portal pressures in your patient and then therefore increase their risk of bleeding. Um, there was an RCT that actually showed that factor seven did not show benefit in controlling esophageal variceal hemorrhage. Um, you know, we've all given factor seven at some point, I think, in our, in our careers. And when patients are bleeding, you know, you just kind of throw everything at them and hopefully something stops bleeding. Um, but um, some of the studies are emerging that n n kind of they're not necessarily um, showing too much benefit. Um, again, to drive home the point, ASLD and ACG both do not recommend FFC transfusion prior to procedures. Does that mean that therefore everyone's going to stop doing it? I think it's going to take a while to, um, A, I think, get all three societies on board to have kind of um, similar guidances. You know, ACG, AGA, and ASLD are all similar, but that's a departure from SIR. Um, but you would argue that the interventional radiologist would probably tell you <laughs> we're the ones doing the procedure, so we get to decide kind of where, where the cutoff is. So I think um, there, there will have to be conversations down the line with all these various societies to maybe come up with some consensus, right, to, um, you know, look at the data and then have those guidelines, you know, translate into clinical practice. 
All right, um, next slide. Fibrinogen. So fibrinogen levels greater than, I'm sorry, less than 100 is associated with both spontaneous and procedure-related bleeding and cirrhosis, but causality has not been established. Um, Antifibrinolytic agents, such as amicar and tranexamic acid, known as Lestata, have not been well studied in cirrhosis. In fact, um, and tran tranexamic acid is often given um, for hemophiliac. There was one study with tranexamic acid. Their subgroup analysis actually showed a higher risk of um, thrombolic events in patients with cirrhosis. So that's another thing you need to think about if you're going to kind of use any of these agents as a Hail Mary. Um, for someone who's really bleeding, um, you have to think about, okay, you know, what, there could be a catastrophic risk of thrombosis. Just as a clinical vignette, we had a patient esophageal bleeding in the unit, Minnesota 2, the whole nine yards. We gave her factor, and, you know, she had an MI. So these scary things can happen. So, you know, all these ages exist, but all have risk benefits. Um, so ASLD says that you can consider using product to get fibrinogen greater than 100 for high-risk procedures, but they say that the data to support that are lacking. And so as you can see in that table that was shown a couple slides, in the end, they say not to correct for fibrinogen, even though they, they say in the text of their guidance that, you know, you can consider it. Um, ACG says anti-fibrinolytic agents are not recommended to reduce bleeding in the absence of hyperfibrinolytic. Um, next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to transition to management of portal vein thrombosis. Um, next slide. So interestingly, um, again, AFLD has been very forward thinking. Um, they're proposing actually a change in nomenclature. Um, instead of acute versus chronic, they want to go recent versus chronic, just kind of so you guys know. Um, the most studied population within cirrhosis and PBT are liver transplant candidates. Um, we know that PBT is associated with more severe portal hypertension. It's kind of interesting to think about because it's like, does PBT mean, um, okay, that the patient just has more severe disease, or is there a causal role in that? Is it because they develop PBT that then they have more severe disease, or just because they have more severe disease? Right now, I, no one really knows the answer to that question, just something to kind of think about. Um, what's the pathogenesis of it? Um, multifactorial, not completely understood. Obviously, it has to do with, you know, decreased velocity of portal vein inflow into the liver. Um, but also, there's also a thought that this is somewhat related to bacterial translocation in the gut, um, endotoxinemia, but that's been not um, adequately studied. Um, there have been epidemiological studies showing that obesity, metabolic syndrome, and NASH um, as in independent risk factors. Um, one thing to take home from PBT management, and it, you know, it seems very obvious, clinical, if there's any clinical evidence of intestinal infarction, you got to go with anticoagulation. So you got to, um, if they're acting, you know, acute abdomen and you're concerned about infarcted bowel, uh, these patients need to be anticoagulated. Um, next slide. Um, again, this is um, Virchow's triad. Um, kind of a throwback to med school, um, what leads to portal and mesenteric venous thromboses, right? You've got stasis, hypercoagulability, and vessel wall injury. And this table from ACG lists the various factors that are involved in each of these three, which all makes sense. You know, you see sluggish blood flow in patients with cirrhosis, patients with heart failure, um, the typical local factors that could be um, actual injury, actual trauma, or patients who have had diverticulitis, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, surgeries, shunts, transplants, interventions. Um, and also, very important, especially in your non cirrhotic patients, always to rule out um, underlying, thrombotic order, underlying thrombotic disorders. Malignancy of any organ can all, always lead to hypercoagulability. Um, but you got to think about kind of the more hematologic issues, such as NPN, PNH, um, pregnancy, use of oral contraceptives. Um, when you're going down that route, it's always um, prudent to co-manage or consult with um, a hematologist. Um, next slide. So these are characteristics um, of PBT and cirrhosis versus non-cirrhotic patients. 
Um, as I said earlier, the most studied cirrhosis population is liver transplant candidates because, in part, you know, we care about the portal vein in patients who are going into transplant. We know that having an open portal vein going into transplant improves your post-liver transplant survival. Um, you know, the, the, the epidemiologic data is kind of mixed, but the prevalence rates seem to be between 1 and 10 percent. Um, and then ASLD actually says for PBT in cirrhotic patients that testing for hypercoagulability is actually rarely useful, which, you know, I thought was different because when I was in med school, we just basically did a hypercoag workup on everyone regardless of whether or not you were cirrhotic or not. Um, so interesting that they note that unless, you know, so they said it's rarely useful unless, you know, something comes up um, in your clinical workup with the patient, you know, if they had a family history or something like that. ACG says to work up if, there's, if the patient has a prior history of thrombus or if they have a family history of thrombus. Um, with any patient with cirrhosis, the first thing you always want to kind of rule out is, is this a malignant PBT versus a bland one, because then your management will change, because we do not anticoagulate from malignant portal vein thromboses. Um, so if, you're, if you have a PBT and you're not cirrhotic, that's usually pretty rare. And those patients should have the full, the full thing, the hypercoagulable workup. Um, they're at risk for having an underlying myel myeloproliferative disorder, which is up to a quarter of cases. A lot of these patients have the JAK2 mutation. Um, and um, many have a thrombophilic disorder with the G20210A prothrombin gene mutation as the most prevalent. Um, next slide. So how do you diagnose a PBT? The most common symptom of patients are going to have symptoms. Um, not all patients are symptomatic. Um, they'll have abdominal pain, usually in the acute or recent uh, PBT. You may also see them presenting with ascites, nausea, abdominal distension. Most of the time, these patients um, are, have been diagnosed through a Doppler ultrasound, going through the ER or routine screening. Um, if they have cirrhosis, um, that's often picked up on a Doppler ultrasound. Um, Cross-sectional imaging is helpful to determine the extent of the thrombus. Um, if your patient presents with fever, leukocytosis, and rebound tenderness, you want to make sure you rule out intestinal ischemia. Uh, next slide. So PVT and liver transplantation. So I mentioned earlier that um, having a patent main portal vein is associated with improved post-liver transplant survival. Um, PBT, interestingly, among weightlifted patients does not necessarily affect weightless mortality. Um, why do we think having a good main portal vein is um, associated with improved post-LT survival? Uh, makes sense, right? Because if you have to do um, a portal vein reconstruction, if you have to do a jump graft, um, obviously those are technically difficult and they take more time. So if you don't have to do all that, then you're going to have Less a less complicated transplant surgery and decreased graft ischemia time. Um, what's been kind of difficult is that there, you know, there are a lot of, again, most of these studies that are done on PBT and liver transplant patients, a lot of these studies are retrospective. And one of the things that has been recognized is that there's a lot of lack of kind of granularity and a lack of um, standardization of how we define and how we think about portal vein thrombus. You know, there's all these different classification scores. Um, but I think when it's diagnosed, it might say, like, oh, it's kind of partially occluded or, it's, you know, or, you know, cavernous transformation or it's completely occluded. But, it, you know, there's no, I don't think there's a lot of standardization in terms of how it's reported and, you know, described. But, you know, if you're in a study, it's usually PVT, yes, no. And so it, it doesn't really kind of go into the details, like, this is how extensive it was and this is how big it was. So it's actually hard to... Um, really understand what exact parameters of, B, of PBT that might determine were kind of better or worse outcomes. Um, so I think there is a there I think there is an unmet need in the literature to in terms of I think there's m more of an opportunity for research to understand kind of the impact of PBT in patients with cirrhosis as well as you know in liver transplant outcomes. Um, in practice, um, and other um, folks uh, can comment. Uh, most liver transplant centers will anticoagulate patients um, who present with a PBT, um, especially if they're liver transplant candidates to maintain pain at the portal vein. Um, 
ASLD states that there are insufficient data to recommend pre-transplant treatment of PBT in order to improve post-liver transplant outcomes, but in practice, um, most centers will do that. Um, next slide. I thought this was an interesting study. This is an old study. Um, this came out almost 10 years ago, but I don't think it's been replicated. But it's interesting just to um, know that this study exists. Um, this was uh, published in gastroenterology, I think, towards the end of my fellowship. Um, and these investigators looked at enoxaparin and whether or not there was a role in its prevention of PBT and liver decompensation in patients with advanced cirrhosis. Um, so they gave patients um, Lovenox 4,000 um, international units daily for 48 weeks and 78 patients, 34 in the active arm and 36 in the control arm. And these patients had child B or C cirrhosis and they did not have PBT. And then they performed ultrasounds every three months and CTs every six months to you know, follow their portal vein, with the primary outcome being whether or not there was any prevention of PBT in patients who received enoxaparin. Um, next slide. Um, so interestingly, at 48 weeks, Oh, yeah. At 48 weeks, um, no patients in the enoxaparin group developed PBT compared to six out of the 36 controls. Um, and at 96 weeks, they extended their follow-up um, with a zero versus 27.7% of the controls. Um, at the end of follow-up, 8.8 .8 versus 27.7, so the numbers were significant. Um, and they also looked at liver decompensation. Um, and so they conclude, this was their statement conclusion. Enoxaparin was safe and effective in preventing PBT in this patient population, and they claimed that it appeared to delay occurrence of hepatic decompensation and improve survival. So, th like I said, this study has not been replicated, and it was just a kind of a that kind of one study that stands alone. Um, oh, and, and also no significant bleeding was reported in either study arm. So it's just something to think about. There is no, there's not enough evidence to. Um, prescribe any anticoagulation for the prevention of PBT in cirrhotic patients, nor is there any evidence to say, okay, we're going to now use it to try to prevent any hepatic decompensation. But um, if, if more studies like this exist, that, that could change the direction of where things go. But I just thought I'd point this out, even though it's an old study, I think it's an interesting one. Um, all right, um, next slide, please. So what about PBT and non -serotic? So I spent the last few slides talking about how do we manage um, PBT in patients with cirrhosis. You know, you don't necessarily have to do a hypercoagulable workup. Um, you know, if they're a liver transplant candidate, you know, you might want to think about anticoagulating them. Um, what do we do in the non cirrhotic patients? Um, the goals of therapy would be, one, to prevent thrombus extension into the mesenteric veins and to try to prevent long-term sequelae of portal hypertension. Um, the next would be to prevent any complications of intestinal ischemia, and the third would be to recanalize the portal vein. Um, you want to give antithrombotic therapy to avoid intestinal ischemia. So if, there, if you're a non-serotic, um, the answer is anticoagulation. You want to prevent you, you want to prevent complications of having that clot in there. Usually, patients are anticoagulated for about three to six months, um, and then usually they're reimaged, and then a decision is made kind of what to do after that. Um, some patients you know, present with septic polypobitis, and those patients usually get anticoagulated and they get antibiotics on top of that. Um, there was a prospective study that was done um, of 100 or so patients with um, acute PBT that were non serotic and anticoagulation did increase um, patency of the portal vein and the SMV. Um, if a non serotic patient has chronic PBT, um, one should anticoagulate that patient if they have an underlying thrombotic disorder. Um, or if they, or if that patient has progression into the mesenteric veins, or if there's any evidence of bowel ischemia. Um, next slide. Sorry if I keep switching back between cirrhosis and non-cirrhosis. Um, so recent PBT, if you have a recent PBT and concern for ischemia in a cirrhotic patient, um, you would want to get anticoagulation going and a surgical consult due to the risk of ischemic bowel. Otherwise, um, it's, a, it's truly a case-by-case -case basis. Um, without ischemic symptoms, clinical trial data are weak. Um, the main goal in treating cirrhotic patients 
as mentioned, um, center around preserving candidacy for liver transplantation um, or to minimize progression uh, to portal hypertension. Um, there was a systematic review, which I think I talk about in the next slide, um, looking at anticoagulation versus no treatment of cirrhotics. Um, there are higher rates of portal vein patency in these patients and a lower risk of variceal bleeding. Um, the ACG says anticoagulation among patients with cirrhosis and um, venous thrombosis is not associated with an increased risk of variceal bleeding. So, you know, that again, I, you know, as I was reading through these guidelines, this is a lot of these recommendations are supported by data and from some limited retrospective studies. Again, it's, it's kind of an interesting statement to say anticoagulation among patients with cirrhosis is not associated with an increased risk of variceal bleeding because I think whenever we see, and even as a hepatologist, right, you see a patient who's cirrhotic who's on anticoagulation, we get a little bit, there's a little trepidation that, that occurs. But um, emerging data show that, um, that it's, it's not necessarily associated with an increased risk of variceal bleeding. That doesn't mean they're not going to ooze or bleed from other things. So um, next slide. Uh, this is the Lafredo study. Um, this, I think this was in gastro. I forgot to put down which journal. Um, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, they looked at the effect of anticoagulation on patients with cirrhosis and PBT. Um, they saw a higher proportion of patients who underwent uh, recanalization and no difference in major minor bleeding in, in these groups. Um, so increased recanalization and reduced pro progression of thrombosis in anticoagulation groups. So I guess, you know, I feel like I'm in, in kind of telling you guys maybe it's not so scary to, to anticoagulate some patients, if, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis if, if you think that the benefits uh, are in their favor. Um, uh, next slide. Ah, more interesting study. So there was another study uh, that came out in Liver International. So these guys were also bold. Um, they showed that low molecular weight heparin continued throughout prophylactic, uh, prophylactic um, esophageal variceal band ligation does not increase risk of bleeding or death. So these patients, this is a retrospective study. They looked at patients from 2009 to 2016. They looked at like 533 bands um, that were placed in 263 patients. So they looked at all these banding procedures that happened, and some patients were on um, heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and others were not. And they said that there was not a difference in bleeding rates between the two groups. So again, there was this, I, I wrote here, there was definitely kind of a, a shift, a direction that anticoagulation may not need to be stopped during EVL, which again is a departure from prior teaching as I was taught, you know, anticoagulation has you usually delay anticoagulation until you've um, eradicated all the varices. But ASLD actually writes that anticoagulation may not need to be stopped um, if you're if you're doing routine band ligation. Whereas ACG says anticoagulation may need to be interrupted in the peripercedural setting of band ligation is performed. So um, again, um, take what you will. Uh, next slide. Other ways of thinking about portal vein thrombosis management in cirrhotic patients, um, one way would be to kind of think about burden of portal vein thrombus. So less than 50% obstruction, or if it's only in the small intrahepatic subbranches, you would not be wrong if you observe the patient and image them every three months without therapy, and then to treat them if the clot is progressive. Um, if the clot is greater than 50% obstructive, um, or it goes in the mesenteric veins, you can consider anticoagulation to avoid progression of thrombosis. Um, for cavernous transformation that's in chronic PVT, there's no established benefit of anticoagulation or interventional therapy, and treatment should be really focused on managing, you know, complications of portal hypertension, such as, you know, ascites and varices. Um, and then um, ASLD says anticoagulation should be initiated, and then they state not to delay until varices have been eradicated or adequate beta blockade. So you could theoretically um, do a scope, start banding, put them in anticoagulation, and you know, depending on your comfort level, you could hold the anticoagulation and reband them, but it shouldn't delay you from starting because as you know, you scope someone, you don't eradicate all the varices, you say come back in four to six weeks, 
scheduling takes some time, and before you know it, you know, two months, maybe even three months has passed. So always important to think about kind of timeline. Um, next slide. So I touched on mostly um, kind of anticoagulation versus non-anticoagulation. There's also thrombolysis and IR procedures. Um, you know, IR folks are so skilled everywhere. Um, if the patient has another indication for a TIPS, um, at least in a lot of our patients, we're doing TIPS and thrombectomy as, as possible um, PVD treatment options. Um, and then for medical therapies, you know, I talk about just blanket anticoagulation, but what are you actually supposed to give patients? You know, obviously there's heparin, there's low molecular weight heparin, there's uh, warfarin, and then you have your direct um, oral anticoagulants, which are actually not well studied in cirrhosis, but um, are increasingly being used um, more and more. Uh, treatment has not been totally standardized. Um, I find that most patient, most providers give kind of what they're comfortable giving or monitoring. Um, and most centers are still using drugs like low molecular, low molecular weight heparin and vitamin K antagonists, given familiarity with those drugs and the availability of having a reversal agent. Um, so, all right, uh, next slide. I hope you guys can see this. I tried to um, magnify it when I uh, copied the, the photo on here. This is from the ASLD guidance, and it's kind of their flow sheet about how to um, kind of go about managing um, someone with PVT. And so step one, PVT suspected on ultrasound. Okay, next thing. Is there any evidence of ischemia or a severe portal hypertension flare? Okay, if that's yes, that makes sense. Admit them to the hospital, okay. If not, um, get cross-sectional imaging, obtain um, Cross-sectional imaging, basically, you want to rule out um, malignancy, a malignant obstruction, and, you know, confirm the diagnosis, figure out the extent of the, um, uh, of the thrombus. Does the patient have another reason for getting a TIPS? Yes. Refer to TIPS or place that has um, IR expertise. If no, then do an endoscopy, assess for high-risk varices, uh, and treat as you would clinically. Uh, next slide. So this just goes down. So the last one was perform upper endoscopy, um, and then it goes a down arrow to is the patient an anticoagulation candidate? If they're not, then you just kind of follow them clinically and medically manage them. If they are an anticoagulation candidate, then yes, you would start anticoagulation. If that person might be a transplant candidate, you can consider a transplant referral, um, and then uh, repeat cross-sectional imaging in two to three months to assess therapy. And so then depending on their treatment response, if they have a treatment response, which is complete, then, you know, interestingly, they, they might consider prophylactic anticoagulant therapy or stop anticoagulation and follow with serial uh, Doppler exams. If they have um, progression on therapy or if they have no treatment response, okay, make sure that they're adhering to their medications. Um, consider stopping anticoagulation since it's not helping anyway, um, or consider some sort of lytic, you know, salvage intravascular procedure. And if they have partial regression, then you just kind of continue the cycle of kind of serial imaging. Um, next slide. Um, this is just a table kind of as a reminder of the, you know, different agents and the, the advantages and disadvantages, frequency of administration, low molecular weight heparin, you know, that's not only it's subcutaneous, the patients have to poke themselves, they have to do it twice a day, um, contraindicated in renal failure. And um, Coumadin um, and DOAX, they're affected from bowel edema and, and portal hypertension, so absorption could potentially be an issue. Obviously, a lot of people like the new agents, the DOAX, because um, you don't need to do the monitoring like you do with vitamin K antagonists. Um, and there is an antidote to all three. For the DOAX, there's only an antidote to, um, it's in my, one of my slides, I think it's uh, Dabigatron, um, that there is an antidote to. Um, and the VKAs and the DOAX are once daily dosing and oral. Um, next slide. 
So these direct oral anticoagulants um, in cirrhosis, um, these, this is a list of all of the, the ones that are available. Um, you know, patients with cirrhosis have historically been excluded from clinical trial studying treatment for uh, veno, venous thrombolic disorders or AFib, um, in part because, you know, cirrhotic patients are, you know, sick and so they're not going to be in your usual, you know, run-of-the-mill um, trials. Um, a lot of the experience that we have is kind of what is center-specific, but a lot of times limited to those with well-compensated cirrhosis. Um, so there is another knowledge gap here. Uh, further studies are needed to establish efficacy and safety in DOAX in patients with cirrhosis and PBT. I just looked at the time, it's 6.49, so I'm going to talk faster. Um, most studies have been retrospective. Um, and interestingly, these studies have shown that bleeding rates are not significantly higher in patients treated with DOAX. So, you know, even though not a lot of studies have been done in them, people have had basically decent experience, um, not a lot of bad outcomes. Um, Idorucizumab is a reversal agent for dabigatran. It's the only one for these DOACs. All the other ones don't have reversal agents. Um, and it's increasingly being used for non cirrhotic patients with portal vein thrombus. Uh, next slide. Okay, we're going to move on to Bud Chiari. Um, Bud Chiari is hepatic vein thrombosis. It's also defined as hepatic venous outflow obstruction from the small hepatic veins to the junction of the IBC and the right atrium. Most patients are pretty young. The median age is 46. Um, Asian countries actually have a pretty high prevalence. They tend to have isolated hepatic vein or isolated um, IBC uh, or combined thrombosis. And most patients have an underlying prothrombotic condition. So if you're diagnosing but Yari, you have to look for um, an underlying thrombocytic disorder. And Table 6 shows you all the different disease states um, that have been associated as risk factors for BCS. Um, a typical presentation could be acute onset of ascites, abdominal pain, hepatomegaly and liver test abnormalities, and a patient can present with fulminant hepatic failure from blood Chiari. Uh, next slide. Um, initial test, Doppler ultrasound. Um, Typical findings, textbook findings, non-visualization of the hepatic vein, collateral veins, and transformation of the hepatic vein into a cord. Sometimes you'll see caudate lobe hypertrophy um, or the caudate vein greater than three millimeters in diameter. Of course, cross-sectional imaging can be used for confirmation, and if diagnostic imaging is non-confirmatory, then denography. Um, next slide. Um, so this is a picture from up to date about uh, of a kind of typical but Chiari um, picture. A lot of these patients have nodularity. So if you look at this, it looks a little bit modeled. A lot of people have nodularity because of the vascular changes that you see in but Chiari. Um, I think some of the studies that have been done show that a lot of people with but Chiari kind of have a disproportionately higher risk of. They have a higher risk of developing HCC. So it's very important in your but Chiari patients to rule out HCC and do close surveillance. And there was a study that showed that AFP greater than 15 could actually be a predictive biomarker for HCC in patients with Bacchiari, but that hasn't been totally validated, but keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and you can't use LIRADS um, to look for these lesions because LIRADS is really only for patients with cirrhosis. It's not meant for um, kind of non cirrhotic liver conditions. Uh, next slide. Um, all right, so consultation with a hematologist is helpful, especially if these patients have a pro underlying thrombophilic disorder. Um, because of this higher risk of HCC, they need to undergo surveillance for HCC. Early referral to a tertiary center is important. These patients need to be anticoagulated. I've got this pyramid thing in the upper right-hand corner because um, most guidances recommend kind of a stepwise um, treatment algorithm. So you start off with anticoagulation, um, roll out the prothrombotic disorder. Data on DOAX is limited for bud Chiari patients, so I would stick to low molecular weight, heparin, followed by vitamin K antagonists. Um, angioplasty really should be reserved for patients with short segment hepatic vein stenosis, and that's usually mostly seen in um, Asian countries, not so much in the, in, in the Western region. Um, next slide. Uh, vascular decompression can be considered if um, other medical therapies fail. So again, at the bottom of that pyramid, there was anticoagulation, and then after that was angioplasty, if there's something that can be intervened upon, and then the next step is TIPS. So a TIPS 
or a dips with a PTFE-covered stent. The PTFE is supposed to reduce the rate of a TIPS dysfunction when medical therapy and angioplasty fail. And the outcomes are actually pretty good. It's a five-year transplant-free survival around 72%. I could consider a surgical shunt if a tip fails, although, you know, surgical shunts are not really done very much these days, if at all. And um, consideration of liver transplantation when the above therapies fail. Um, and these patients uh, generally need to be um, anticoagulated long-term. Okay, um, next one, next slide, please. So these are just going to be kind of highlights of um, alphabet soup, of SOS, of HHT. Um, so SOS, this is a hepatic acinus. Um, so as you see, there is the liver sinusoid and what happens with SOS, which is super rare. I think I've only seen a few cases of it. The sinusoidal endothelial cells get damaged here. And then what happens is these cells, they get damaged, they become necrotic and that results in um, partial and complete occlusion of the hepatic venules. Um, next slide, please. Um, and that all the obstruction occurs in zone three of the hepatic acinus. Um, these patients often present with a portal hypertension and it's post sinusoidal. Um, most commonly seen after myeloablative chemotherapy regimens used prior to hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. I'm not going to read these all. These are all the agents that are typically associated with SOS. Interestingly, um, pyrolizidine alkaloids, these are kind of plant herbal tea products. There are certain classes of these um, herbs that are from certain plants that are in this alkaloid category that have been really well um, established in the pathogenesis of SOS. So if you have someone that has it, ask them if they are consuming herbal teas. Um, not all herbal teas contain this, so I do not want you to stop drinking your herbal teas necessarily. These patients will have pain, edema, hepatomegalocytes. Usually the typical timeline is one to three weeks after transplant. Next slide. There's actually some mixed data that there could be benefit to giving ursodiol. So I'm assuming, and I, I think this is really probably more in the oncologic realm, a lot of um, there is some benefit to giving urso. So you start it um, right um, when patients are undergoing allogenic um, transplant, and the dose is 12 mg per kg in two doses. And then there's one FDA approved treatment for SOS called dispibitide, um, and the mechanism of action is unclear, but it's thought to have anti inflammatory and anticoagulant properties, um, and it's for moderate to severe SOS. Next slide, please. HHT, um, autosomal dominant, one in five to 8,000 patients. Um, these patients present with widespread AVMs, typical pictures that you see in the medical textbooks that can be in the lung, brain, GI tract, skin, mucous membranes. And these patients also have um, liver vascular malformations in about you know, 40 to 70% of patients. Next slide, please. Um, this is the diagnostic criteria for HHT. Um, so depending on whether or not, you know, they were having epistaxis, telangiectasias, if this role involved in our family history, that tells you definite probability or non-likelihood of HHT. Next slide, please. This is also from Ansel D. It's also in a couple other papers. Um, this is kind of typical presentation of HHT, depending on what type of shunting you have. So as you can see here, there's different types of shunting that you can have with these liver vascular malformations, but the most common one being hepatic artery to hepatic vein shunting, where patients present with high output heart failure and biliary ischemia. Um, and a lot of patients also, um, depending on their pathogenesis, um, you can have FNH, focal nodular hyperplasia, and nodular regenerative hyperplasia because you have blood shunting that causes these perfusion abnormalities in the liver parenchyma. And obviously, if you have NRH, then you're going to be at rest portal hypertension. Um, these patients with biliary ischemia, because the hepatic artery supplies the bile ducts, if you have biliary ischemia, you're going to develop that stuff, secondary sclerosing cholangitis, necrosis, bilomas. Um, and the patients that have the high output heart, heart failure, they get it due to shunting um, from the hepatic artery um, at, into the systemic circulation. So those are kind of general ways that these LVMs, liver vascular malformations, can um, present. Next slide. Um, treatment. So usually there's no treatment if you're asymptomatic. You also know surveillance if you're asymptomatic, but if you're symptomatic, it depends on what your issue is. So if you've got heart failure, that's one leg. If you're infected from a bioma, it's antibiotics. 
Um, bevacizumab has been given. It's a VEGF inhibitor. It can improve epistaxis, um, even your cardiac index and your ischemic cholangiopathy. Uh, patients actually do pretty well with transplant. Some of the tra uh, survival data is from the European registry um, that shows a pretty decent 10-year patient graft survival, but the, these LBMs can occur as soon as six years after transplant. Next slide. Um, one slide on idiopathic non cirrhotic portal hypertension, uh, which is portal hypertension in the absence of cirrhosis, portal vein obstruction, by Chiari, absence of sarcoidosis, schistosomiasis, and congenital hepatic fibrosis. Um, the, the table on the right shows all the um, disorders that can be associated with idiopathic non cirrhotic portal hypertension. These patients do need a liver biopsy to make sure they don't have cirrhosis. Um, Quite interesting. I mean, these patients behave as if they have cirrhosis and they have, you know, GI bleeding, bad variceal bleeding, they have ascites. Um, and yes, these disorders have been known. I've had a few patients actually with CVID that present with non cirrhotic portal hypertension. Um, next slide. Um, this isn't super well defined, so this is just kind of a smorgasbord. So, hepatic artery aneurysms are pretty uncommon. Um, not a lot of data, at least in liver world, on this. This is more, you know, I have some slides from the vascular surgery guidelines. Um, you know, what's the risk factor for hepatic artery aneurysm? A true one, atherosclerosis, trauma infection. Um, pseudoaneurysms, we see usually from trauma, from a biopsy, or from, you know, a PTBD or a cholecystectomy. Next slide. Splenic artery aneurysms, my experience with those have been limited. Usually that's picked up incidentally because I've ordered a CT scan for HCC surveillance or for HCC, and it turns out they have a splenic artery aneurysm. Um, what do I do about that? Um, mostly it's been seen in females. There's been an association with multiparity and splenic artery aneurysms. Most patients are older. Um, again, most of these are found incidentally. Most of the time they're around two centimeters, but you know, while the incidence of rupture is low, the mortality is 20 to 36%. Uh, next slide, I just have like a few more left. Um, ASLD says if the, the aneurysms are less than two centimeters, just do follow-up imaging. Um, obviously an urgent intervention if you're symptomatic, um, and then please get your vascular surgery and IR colleagues on board. For, H, for hepatic artery aneurysms, there's no database recommendations for surveillance. And for the splenic artery ones, the traditional surgical teaching has been, you know, maybe think about it intervention at two, um, and consider an intervention in patients who are planning pregnancy or in liver transplant candidates. Um, next slide. Um, this is from the vascular surgery guidance, and I go into a little bit more so we can go to the next slide. We can go to, oh yeah. Um, so this is from the um, vascular surgery guidelines, and they basically say for hepatic artery aneurysms, um, they recommend repair if a true aneurysm is greater than two centimeters. Um, they recommend repair of symptomatic ones regardless of size. Um, next slide. For the splenic artery ones, um, they basically say, I'm looking at number 2.4, we recommend treating non-ruptured splenic artery true aneurysms greater than or equal to three centimeters um, or those with an increase in size or with associated symptoms. Um, they say to observe for the ones that are less than three, um, and then, yeah. Okay, um, next slide. So, summary, um, hemostasis is complicated in patients with cirrhosis. They can bleed and clot on, on you all at the same time. Um, correction prior to procedure should be considered carefully, as current data show that transf transfusions do not necessarily decrease the risk of bleeding and, and may, in some cases, increase your bleeding risk. Um, you know, management of PVT depends on, you know, whether or not you have cirrhosis or not. Um, we need more studies to better understand the natural history of PVT and its impact on mortality among all patients with cirrhosis, including the pre- and post-transplant patients. Um, DOACs are increasingly used but not well studied in liver disease, so a lot of our experience is kind of anecdotal. Um, while rare, it's still important to understand the diagnosis and management of kind of these rare diseases like Chiari, SOS, and HHT. And also important to recognize that non-steroidic portal hypertension is another entity contributing to bleeding and ascites. Um, next slide. Thank you for your time. I know I, I talked a lot. Um, here is my email address if you have questions. Um,
I'm looking at a couple questions that just got sent. Have you used IR help to do a thrombectomy? Yes. So we, we see a lot of patients with um, portal vein thrombus and, you know, it depends on the burden. You know, usually we try a trial of anticoagulation, um, but again, if a patient needs a TIPS for another reason, or if there is an indication for a TIPS, um, sometimes we will do anticoagulation and then get them for a TIPS thrombectomy, but also at the same time working them up for liver transplant. When asked about bleeding and risk assessment with procedures in cirrhotics, how do you convey that to teams who may have consulted you on a case for clearance or assessment for procedures? Um, you know, I think that's um, a really interesting question because I think there's, as I mentioned earlier in the chat, there is a disconnect between what the data says and what we're all doing in practice. You know, like, am I gonna, am I really gonna not stop anticoagulation while I'm trying to ban varices? I probably will stop it because it, it's kind of, so I think, you know, it's, I think it's important to educate that that's what's there, but it's not only do we need to educate our GI and liver colleagues, but it's also kind of, like I said, a conversation with the radiologists and the hospitalists. And so I think this is just the beginning of trying to, to really, um, to really, it's a, I think it's a paradigm shift because people feel super weird doing a procedure in someone who has a really high INR or like no platelets. So, um, those are, I just saw those two questions on the, on the chat box. Thank you, Dr. Ho, for that amazing talk. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. And, you know, this is all recent because this guideline was just about last, last year that was just released. So, thank you for the updates. You're welcome. Uh, is there anyone else who have a question? So, then we're sorry to keep you guys all five minutes after seven. If not, then I guess we'll conclude our talk and then Dr. Ho can go back on service. Um, All right. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. if I can ask one quick question, uh, with the thiopurines and the SOS, um, do you find that if you stop, uh, most often one of the things you look for with, I believe, thiopurines is elevated L LFTs. Uh, do you find that once you stop it, you don't have to deal so much with the SOS or... Uh, I've never really faced or seen SOS before. Yeah, um, you know, the, the usually these patients look a little bit sicker than just, you know, lab abnormalities. They're going to have ascites, they're going to have edema, they're going to have pain. Um, so if it's just elevated LTs, it's not necessarily SOS. I mean, yes, the thyroid can be associated with it, but they have, they'll have a kind of sicker presentation. Um, and oftentimes, you would need, you know, a liver biopsy or something to kind of further assess. But if you stop it and their LFTs go back down, then I wouldn't worry too much about it. I see. Thank you. Great. Thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate everyone's time during dinner time on, on a weekday evening. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Thanks again. Thank